that was just held. We hold quarterly meetings um, once every uh, four times a year. Uh, the last one was held and hosted by our friends at CBS. Thanks to them for doing that. Um, and so this is going to be a report basically on those um, things. And let me see if I can get my slides working here. There we go. I went too far, like I always do. Um, so this is, again, going to be a, a follow-up report on the June plenary meeting, and also includes stuff that's been ongoing for some time to uh, get everybody up to speed. Um, as you can see, at the June plenary, um, there was nine technology committees that met. Eleven subgroups um, were scheduled to also meet at that time. It's good to get face-to-face -face stuff done. Uh, and there were 70 mem members that attended in person. Uh, over the complete four days that we held it there, and uh, also people uh, attuned through WebEx and remote access as well. And currently, uh, as it says, there are uh, 190 active projects, so uh, SEMPTE standards is quite busy at the moment. Um, for those that aren't familiar with the SEMPTE standards, I'm going to just give you a little rough overview. We won't get into a deep dive of this, just so you know kind of what we're talking about. As you can see, there's more than just the nine committees, technical committees, if you will, uh, things like 20F, the film side, doesn't usually meet at the plenary quarter meetings that we have. So um, under applications, of course, you have the 21DC, 24TB, 25CSS, uh, 10E under essence and metadata, as well as 30MR, which is a metadata registry. And the infrastructure and media management has the 31FS, 32NF, 34CS, and 35PM. Of course, rattling through a lot of numbers here, you don't need to memorize these things, or uh, we'll go through this in much more detail. Over the top of this is the standards committee. This is made up of most of the chairs of each one of the technical committees, uh, as well as other folks that are invited to participate in that group. It's basically the administrative arm, if you will, run by Mr. Lamshed um, to take care of all of the things that prop up and come up in the standards work itself, including scheduling the meetings and all that kind of good stuff. So that gives you kind of a brief overview, if you will. Um, what we're going to do today is go through uh, each one of the tele uh, technical committees um, that met during the June plenary and discuss the projects that they kind of have gone on, um, basically that they have going on or have just recently completed. And uh, we'll uh, start off probably with uh, Alan uh, giving some basic uh, information about these projects. Um, there's a lot of new projects that got started last quarter. Um, I won't go into each one of those in detail. Also, if you like, this quarterly report uh, appears after every plenary meeting, and you can get it on the SEMPTE.org website. If you go underneath standards, uh, and fish around there. I don't know the exact one. I think Joel might be able to put it up for you or put it out in the newsletter. We have it as well, too, of where you can find this quarterly report. This will have all of the details in it. And Peter, were you going to say something there? Or he, he was just holding his hand up because he just wanted to say hello. Yeah, so, the, um, the, and how yeah, it's under, how, okay. yeah, the link is under uh, engineering committees, and uh, that's where you'll find the most recent report. And I'm actually going to uh, distribute it with the uh, handout function for GoToWebinar here in just a moment, if you don't mind. That's yeah, great. fantastic. Thank you. And in there, you're going to get a lot more detail of what happened. So we're going to, you know, in one hour, we can't cover in detail all the stuff that goes on. Uh, the best thing to do if you're really interested in standards, of course, is um, uh, sign up and join and help us out. Um, we're especially looking for people from the user community. Um, we have a lot of manufacturers, a lot of consultants, a lot of content creators and those types of things, but we are shy on the user community side of things. And so uh, we greatly appreciate it if you have the time to help out on standards, especially if you have an area of expertise in here um, that you wish to participate. It would be fantastic. So um, we'll start going through each one of these. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to bring up is there's, um, as we go through this, we'll highlight the areas probably in look a little bit more detail than those that have uh, more interest, if you will, than some of the other projects that are going on. Um, a lot of things on the top level that we're looking at is especially has to do with high dynamic range at the moment and wide color gamut. We're also working on high frame rate, especially when it has to do with time code. Uh, we'll talk about that stuff in detail. Um, there's also a lot of work going on at the moment in professional media over IP. That would be uh, through studio video and for through um, things like recognizing and uh, device control and things of, of that nature. 
Also, of course, with the new UHD stuff coming out, there's a lot of work being done in SDI interfaces to keep pace with that. Uh, and then there's a lot of work, especially in the interoperability side, going on right now with network-based uh, synchronization um, for the professional media environment. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have our favorite topic, time labels. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that as well, too, as we go through the process. Um, and video compression standards have always uh, been a big part of SEMTI standards. A little bit of that, and then we'll talk about immersive audio too as well in the cinema sound side of things, which is the 25 CSS that takes care of that. Um, also, digital cinema is still uh, got stuff going on, uh, tidying up uh, documents and increasing uh, the work in that area. We'll touch base on that, and then of course MXF is always continually in motion to some aspect, and we'll cover those grounds as well too. So again, uh, if you want the detailed information, probably best to go and pull the quarterly report. Uh, and uh, we'll start now diving into each one of the technical committees, um, starting with the first one, which is the 10E. Uh, and Alan, I think I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about uh, this committee. Um, we're not going to read, just in the format for this presentation to give you up to speed, we're not going to read what the scope is of the application. We've included it for those that aren't aware of the committee and what its scope is and purpose. And then we also want to uh, kind of toot the horn of those committees on the first page here of that have just recently published uh, documents in the last quarter. So with that, uh, Alan, why don't you take it away? And Peter, feel free to chime in with anything you have as well, too. Right. Uh, one more thing I was going to add uh, before we get into the individual committees is that the uh, September issue of the journal has the annual progress report and there's a very detailed uh, listing from each of the technology committees in there of what they've been working on over the last year and what they've accomplished. So I would uh, just draw your attention to that. Uh, that's the September, always the September journal version uh, is the progress report. Okay, uh, so let's get into uh, uh, TC10E, uh, which is our Essence Technology Committee, and uh, they've been a busy committee and they continue to be one of our most active committees. Uh, recently published a couple of registered disclosure documents, uh, uh, both to do with compression. So one is the uh, TECO Lightweight Codec, which is uh, being proposed as uh, a way of doing mezzanine compression to fit some of these bigger signals into uh, smaller payloads. Uh, and then RDD36 is the Apple ProRes uh, one, which is widely used in the industry. Um, and Alan, it, if, if I can interrupt you there, why don't you explain briefly what an RDD is versus what a standard is? That might help folks out that uh, aren't familiar. Yeah, good point. So a registered disclosure document is a document that is um, put forward by a, a particular manufacturer, typically. And uh, the purpose of it is for them to disclose the technology that they have in a proprietary format so that uh, other people can interoperate with that format. So it's not a standard. It doesn't go through the same due process uh, evaluation that standards and recommended practices do. But it does go through uh, a process of approval that uh, helps to make sure that the document is adequate to describe the technology and that it's consistent uh, with itself uh, properly referencing any of the other uh, SIMPTE standards that it needs to along the way. So uh, we have uh, close to 40 RDDs now, and these are, uh, uh, again, submitted by uh, different companies for different uh, purposes, and um, uh, it's a good way of a company disclosing their uh, information to make it available to um, the wider industry. Fantastic. And, and Peter, maybe if I ask you, there's a SEMPTI OV. What's the OV document for those that aren't familiar? Oh, it, sorry, Peter, you're muted there. Yeah, you might want to turn. Would, there you go. <laughs> yeah, the, the OV is an overview document. At one stage, we described these as roadmaps, but uh, decided not to continue to use that terminology because we're not mostly in a forward-looking thing. So where we have a family of standards, uh, that, for example, describe different aspects of serial digital interface, the overview document sort of says, hey, he here's a map, here's a guide to what all of the different documents are for uh, and, you know, how they interact with each other, fit together to, to a complete family. The overview document is always free to access 
and it's a useful guide if you're interested in a particular area. Have a look at the overview first, give you an idea of which of the standards you might need uh, and how they particularly uh, you know, conform to your requirements. Uh, if I can go back just to RDDs for a moment, um, everything Alan said was uh, quite correct, of course. Uh, I think it's easy to underestimate how valuable these are. Um, when a company decides to publish an RDD, uh, even though, uh, as Alan says, it's not a standard, it does go through a review by the technology committee, and typically the documents that are published uh, are quite substantially improved by the fact that a number of experts look at them, uh, how to help, help th uh, dive in with how to make them clearer, how to avoid ambiguities, and this sort of thing. So the quality of the document is typically uh, made very good by the review process, even though it's a proprietary format uh, that's disclosed. Uh, and also the committee has to check that it really it does do everything it claims to do, provide you with enough information. Uh, it's not just a marketing piece to say, hey, we've got this great technology. Uh, if it's an RDD, it really has to provide you enough information to usefully uh, interoperate with that company or, or consortium products. Yeah, that's that's a really good point to bring up. Also, um, uh, it, it's uh, usually a good way to, to, to for proprietary things to get out there. You know, in some cases, probably people could build equipment uh, based on the RDD if it's put together properly. And, and like you said, it gets a really good peer review. Um, so, Alan, back to the 10E committee on these. Anything else you want to talk about these published documents here, or should we move on to the projects? Um, no, let's move into the projects. Okay, um, here we go with the projects that are going on in 10E. Maybe if you want to talk at a very high level on each one of these. Right, so 10E uh, is the committee that looks after all of our video compression standards. And currently there are three different families of video compression standards that are being worked on in 10E. There's uh, VC2, which is a lighter weight codec. There's VC3 and VC5, which is the um, Cineform GoPro codec that's been standardized now by Simti. So there's a whole uh, bunch of work going on in those uh, three different areas. Some of them are updating documents, some of them are adding capabilities, uh, some of them are fixing ambiguities in the first uh, versions of the document. So, um, yeah, and, and on those, Alan, if I can ask, is, so is there a VC1? And uh, the VC2 and VC3, what are those related to? Is Right, so there is a VC1. Um, the VC obviously stands for video compression. Um, there is no VC4 uh, because uh, that's not um, a friendly number for our Japanese colleagues, so they decide to skip over four. Uh, but uh, VC1 was uh, proposed, uh, submitted by Microsoft, and uh, that was the first video compression standard that we did probably five or six years ago. VC2 is, uh, was submitted by the BBC and is based on the Dirac uh, uh, compression engine. And uh, again, it's a lighter weight compression that um, is used often for, um, for just helping, helping HD signals, for example, to travel in SD uh, bandwidths and now Ultra HD in uh, in HD bandwidth, so uh, it's it's a lighter weight compression. The VC3 was submitted by Apple, and that's um, I forget what the underlying technology that Apple has uh, standardized there, but it's um, so when I say they were submitted by those, the original documents were submitted for standardization by those companies, but they are simply standards, and so they went through a full peer review, and uh, in all cases, the ending documents were substantially improved from the uh, original submissions and um, in some cases changed also significantly to make them uh, more robust as standards. And they are all multi-part documents. Did you say VC3 was Apple? Yes. It is actually Avid. Avid, sorry. Avid, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, sorry, I stand corrected. Yeah. 
Fantastic. So uh, you've, we've got some other projects going on there. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about those? Some of those, I think, if I recognize, are pretty close to completion and getting standards out the door. Right. So one of the one of the big projects that's been going on for quite a while now in Tenney is the reference display uh, project. And uh, so with the move from uh, away from CRT monitors to uh, uh, fixed pixel matrix monitors. Uh, there was a, a vacuum there for a standardized way of documenting what a reference display should be doing and what it should be look like and how it should be calibrated. And uh, so there's been a bunch of work done. I think there are two documents now that are published. There's a couple more that are being worked on. And as you can appreciate, it's a massive amount of work. Um, but we've had uh, really good contributions and we've had some uh, I might add some good technical contributions from folks at uh, um, Rochester Institute of Technology who've got a, a whole department that's working on uh, this technology. So they've done some of the underlying uh, science behind some of this stuff and have contributed that and are actively involved in that. So that's, that's a big project. It's still ongoing. Uh, uh, SMPTE 2080 is the, is the root number for that whole suite of documents. Yeah, that's uh, great. And, and and also, I think the other big important thing is going on, I mean, we, we, we can probably skip over the depth map representation. That's just about out the door. It's not uh, that controversy. But um, a lot of work on uh, wide color gamut uh, um, metadata as well, too. Maybe you can touch base on that one, the ST2094. Right. right. So the ST2094 is the, uh, the family of documents on um, dynamic metadata for transformation of color space uh, from the wide color gamuts into a, um, the standard 709 color gamut so that when stuff gets transformed to be displayed on uh, older uh, viewing environments that don't support the wider color gamut that it's not just merely clipped but it's actually transformed in a way that is uh, gives sort of the best uh, the best intent of the original content producer again that's a that's a big uh, area. There's several documents involved there um, and there's several applications that have been submitted again by different people because there unfortunately are multiple ways of doing um, metadata and multiple ways of doing the wide color gamut stuff. Um, so there's, there's actually uh, four applications that are being currently worked on and um, you'll see in one of the other committees that there's also a project now for how to carry that metadata uh, through our interfaces so that it can travel along with the essence. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, not, that's not part of 10E, but that, that's very important work as well. Right, so very important stuff going along with HDR and wide color gamut that's coming up. Uh, let's skip over the television lighting consistency. That's a new project that's kind of got started and talk maybe a little bit more about what is haptal Haptic Tactile Essence, that's kind of a new one that's appeared in SEMPTE. Yeah, so that's, um, um, if you've been in, in theaters that have uh, seats that shake uh, in accordance with the, uh, with the soundtrack of the, the movie, the, the concept is to bring that same experience, uh, probably a lot for sports, but into the home uh, through television. And so uh, it was a, a significant um, amount of work to actually define what the essence is that we're actually carrying and then how to carry it along with the signals. So um, it's a tactile, uh, it's, it's the feel that goes along with the look and feel of television. So typically we've had the look and uh, the haptic stuff is the feel. Yeah, fantastic. It's kind of new stuff that's come into SEMPTE just uh, recently, I think in the last year or so. Uh, maybe we can skip over the next ones there. It looked like they're pretty self-explanatory yeah. uh, and move on to the next committee so we don't run out of time here. Um, <clears throat> next committee being the 21DC. Uh, again, I won't go through and read the scope. You guys can read it there, um, chaired by Dean Bullock. And now Chris Witham has joined us as well, too, for this committee. This deals with everything digital cinema technology-wise. Let's skip into the projects of the next sheet that got. So these are the projects. Um, maybe, Alan or Peter, if you want, just to cover over these things briefly. It, most of the stuff is fairly narrowly focused in digital cinema. And it looks like most of the stuff is working on revisions of documents, um, and there's not a whole lot of new stuff maybe coming out in 21DC. 
Yeah, Howard, actually, I think you're closer to this stuff than I am. I don't know whether you want to speak to it. <laughs> I'll punch yeah, on it. I can, I, I, I can go through it, sure. As you can tell, not all of us are experts in all areas. It just can't be because there's so much information for this. So um, on the 21DC projects, there's facility list management. This is basically what allows you to transmit an interoperable list of what uh, equipment is in a facility uh, so that you can create keys and, and all that content for these things. So um, there is a revision of the 30-7. Uh, I don't know exactly the details on why it's being revised, but generally documents, if you're unfamiliar with this empty process, do come up for revisions after the first year it's published and then every five years after that to make sure that it keeps consistent with equipment that's out in the field or things that have changed or things that may have been overlooked or maybe uh, weren't exactly spelled out correctly in the uh, original document that went out. So that's been revision. And there's also a, a, a work on a new document to, to really list a protocol for exchanging these facility list managements, or FLMs as they're called, because we love acronyms here. Uh, also revisions uh, that are coming back up on the DCDM for subtitle um, and the DCP for time tracks files and uh, DCP operational constraints as well too. And then also some work on digital cinema XML constraints as XML is a big part of digital cinema. Uh, and then of course in the encryption projects, um, we did saddle ourselves up with the FIPS um, specifications. So there's a lot of <clears> the <throat> work that needs to be done to make sure that as FIPS does their revisions, do we update the digital cinema documents to reflect those or do we take a different path uh, on the FIPS stuff that's required? So those are revisions and re amendments that are coming up in the 21DC. Uh, and I'll, I'll pause here for a little bit again. Um, if you have questions, throw them our way. Uh, and then Peter and Alan, if you have anything to add to that, uh, we can add that in now or we'll move on to the next technical committee. And Howard, we have no uh, questions in the uh, queue, uh, but I do want to inform our guests that I have posted the PDF of the most recent report in uh, as a handout, and you should be able to access it in the uh, control panel. But um, in the chat, I've also added a link to the uh, most recent, but also a link to uh, that and prior reports so that people can just click on the links and uh, access them directly. Fantastic, and it looks like we're up to about 95 folks that are attending this, so good to see everybody come out and learn more about standards. Um, so the next committee that we'll go into is the Television and Broadband Media Committee, 24TB, chaired by Mr. Dolan. Uh, again, not going to read the scope for this stuff, but let's move into the project side of this stuff. And uh, I think we can ping pong this back and forth, but uh, maybe, Alan, if you want to pick up and start on this, uh, 24TB has been a pretty active um, uh, technology committee in the past and one of their biggest claims to fame, which is not documented here, is their uh, time text and closed caption, which is actually uh, won Emmys for SEMPTI and other folks as well too. So uh, great work that was done here. Right. So one of the um, projects that is uh, well underway in 24TB is the lip sync uh, measurement pro uh, project and there were two documents published uh, last year, I believe, around NAB time. And uh, those are the first two of, I think, what is envisioned to be four parts of a document. So basically, to try and help solve the uh, audio-video sync uh, issue that uh, we've probably all experienced in television, uh, this uh, set of documents uh, does uh, allows a method of measuring uh, the sync uh, early in the process, and then at later parts in the process, measuring it and even adjusting then the sync if it gets out of sync. Uh, so there's a fingerprint that's actually um, uh, generated and then uh, is carried in along with the data. And, um, and so those are the first two parts of the document. Um, the one that is currently being worked on uh, is an engineering guideline which is actually going to explain how everything all works together. And uh, I think that's making good progress, but um, when it's a tutorial in nature, of course, there's always the, uh, the temptation to keep putting more and more stuff in it. And uh, at, at some point, we need to get it out so that people have a, a way of uh, using it. 
So that's the, that's the AV sync measurement. That uh, project has been ongoing for uh, a long time, and it's uh, hopefully going to draw to a conclusion shortly. Uh, the uh, document on open binding technology. Uh, this is uh, for the uh, basically for carrying identifiers for uh, the content along with the content so that uh, it can be identified as to what it is and where it came from uh, as it transforms through the television system. So there's um, a lot of work being done in this area and it's uh, it's also trying to be harmonized with work that's going on in the ATSC uh, that they're working on to uh, uh, bind the stuff and we're trying to make sure that what they're doing and what we want to do is consistent and not in conflict with each other. So there's, uh, it sort of went on a hiatus for a while, but they're back now to um, actively working on the documents. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you want to say any more about that, Howard or Peter. Well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll throw it to Peter. You know, it shows here, people may not be familiar, we talk about a suite of documents, and uh, we used to have in the old days just one document for one technology and seemed to work, but that's not the case that we're doing now. Maybe, Peter, you can talk a little bit about uh, how we're doing parts of documents and and things of that nature. Yeah, it's, um, it's a technique we started using, I don't know, maybe around 10 years ago. Um, and in, in, probably a good example is to talk about, well, digital cinema is one good example, where we have uh, several families of documents for digital cinema, including the 428 series, uh, which basically describes the uh, digital cinema, um, <laughs> help me out, Howard, sorry, DCDM. DCDM, yep, yep which is Digital Cinema Distribution... Distribution Master, Master. yes. That's right, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, and it has a part one that deals with video, a part two that deals with audio, and a whole slew of other parts that uh, relate to the DCDM uh, and really all have to be considered as a family. But when we look at them for both from the point of view of generating the documents and from the point of view of reviewing the documents uh, for possible updating, they're all quite separable areas of technology uh, and very often we can go in and update one of the documents without any negative effects on the, uh, the rest of the documents in the family. So, uh, and, and perhaps the biggest thing is if we were to try and describe a DCDM in a single document, it would probably be close to a thousand page document, um, which would take forever to get right. Uh, it would be an enormous task any time we uh, set about doing uh, revisions. Uh, and it would be, I think, much more difficult for users to handle. Uh, the family approach gives them a targeted uh, direction to look for the, the standards that impact particular areas of technology within the family. Right, and there's yeah, one and, more. And yeah, go ahead. One more uh, benefit of that is that it brings together under a common number a whole bunch of documents that are related to the same topic. So, um, for example, the, um, the time code documents are all SMPTE 12 1 2 3. So it, it helps you find stuff instead of having uh, the first part at one number and the second part at some other number that's totally unrelated. So that's another benefit of having the multi-part documents. Yeah, it's, it, <clears throat> it's uh, very similar to like component video broken into R, G, and B, so uh, it's analogous with that. If we mess with the green channel, we don't have to mess with the red and the blue channel. Um, uh, great stuff. And, and then the OV, of course, as we described earlier, is the document on top of all of that that kind of explains the suite of documents, if you will. So getting hold of the OV uh, document or the dash OV of a document suite would really give you a good clue of uh, how the suites organized together, what documents relate, and all the documents that are actually in the suite. And so 2017, for example, uh, I think is proposed to have a part one, two, three, uh, and four. Uh, two of them are standards. Uh, one is an RP and the other one is an EG. So standard being the most formal, uh, RP being a recommended practice, and EG being an engineering guideline. Um, now back to the 24 TV stuff, uh, I guess they're also doing some revisions as well too. Uh, you want to just touch base on that and we'll move to the yeah, next. So the, so the revision for the AFD and BAR data is uh, 
stuff that is expanding that standard to accommodate ultra high definition. Uh, when it was originally done, it was standard definition and high definition only. So it's really just being updated to uh, the modern video formats that we're carrying now. And uh, I think ST2010 revision is just a matter of updating references. It's a fairly normal part of our five-year review. Gotcha. Gentlemen? Okay, we'll move. Yes, go ahead. do have one question here, and you, you may have covered it, but um, our guest has posted a question. Uh, this is from Ian. Um, is uh, ST2064 for IP or traditional SDI? For, uh, it's actually dealing with the baseband video, and it's completely irrespective of, uh, it's, it's really dealing with the essence. And um, uh, so there is, part two deals with SDI and IP. Um, and there's also a part three that is being envisioned, which will have to do with files. So, so dealing the stuff uh, actually not in streaming formats, but in files. So it does cover both. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think to, to follow up on that, basically this is the suite that defines a set of metadata, and then from that definition defined metadata, there's ways to map that into the other downstream either file format or streaming interfaces. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, Alan. Yeah, it's actually not metadata. It's actually generating the fingerprint, which identifies the, the individual frames of video and audio. Ah, gotcha. Great. Uh, hopefully that answers the question, and uh, we'll move on to the Cinema Sound Systems 25 CSS. Uh, again, this is uh, audio that's looking specifically at <coughs> Cinema B chains, uh, and has nothing to do with, <coughs> sorry, the production side of it. It's uh, basically on the theatrical side of things, and so we'll go into this one with the 25 CSS. If you want, Alan, I can cover this, or? Yeah, yeah if you uh, wouldn't mind, Howard. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that, being a little bit more familiar uh, with the theatrical side. So uh, there's a new um, standard, I think, that's been published now, the 2095-1, which is a calibrated pink noise. Um, I guess for the longest time, and I was unaware of this, I think a lot of people were, that uh, yes, there was pink noise that was out in the world, but uh, there was no real standard based on it and how it should reflect across a wideband uh, signal. So this is now out and in the world, uh, and I think what we're trying to do at the moment too here for some test materials is create a um, pink noise uh, DCP, test DCP if you will, that will be able to go out to the world for people to use as setup. So that's something that uh, headquarters has been looking into. It's a little slow for us to get this stuff off the ground, so bear with us on that side of things. Um, there's also a new uh, document suite that's being uh, put together for uh, proposal for sound system setup and calibration, uh, B-Change calibration procedure. Um, I'm not a part of that. I won't dive in too much on that one because I don't know all the details on it. And then, of course, the biggest topic <clears throat> that 25 CSS has been working on is uh, interoperability of immersive sound systems. If you're familiar with Atmos, Oro, uh, DTS, um, X, um, and other types of Asano systems, there are multiple different proprietary systems at the moment to deliver an immersive sound. Uh, into a theater. Immersive sound means being able to place objects getting past the 7.1 channels all the way up to, in some cases, uh, it's been talked about 22.1 in UHD. Uh, that's not actually in the theater side of things. Um, and so there's been a lot of debate, discussion, um, grinding of teeth, if you will, about what system can we pick. Um, stay tuned on this one. If you're interested in this, you should check into the standards process now. Um, this is really a place where business interests versus standardization really comes into play. Um, so I'll kind of leave it at that. Uh, there may be some business things that need to be sorted out on this one before we actually can come to a consensus on what is the best way to do this. Um, that's immersive digital sound systems. Um, they're also talking about a renderer uh, in immersive sound as well too, and then uh, how to uh, create a, a standardized immersive uh, bit stream and model that goes around with this stuff. So a lot of work has been done in this area, a lot of discussion. Um, there's a special TC meeting I think coming up in the next month to discuss the very topic of how they should move forward on this. Um, as usual, SEMPTI tries to be a place where we can get consensus uh, that doesn't always happen in every time. So this is a moving target, if you will. Um, Peter or Alan, you want to add anything to that? 
No, other than that, it's a very active um, and busy committee. Absolutely. No, I think you covered it very well. Alex. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next one then. Metadata and Registers Committee, um, chaired by John Hurst and Mike DeValue. Uh, these are new chairs that have come in now to pick up this um, side of the, the equation. So thank you to them for picking this up. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very good, exciting working committee, um, and they have a bunch of stuff going on, although uh, metadata is an interesting topic. So um, maybe, Alan, I'll throw it back to you on this one. I, I can cover a few areas potentially, but uh, we can divide and conquer on this one. Right. So sort of the overall thing that's happening there is that we're, we've moved um, away from publishing our metadata standards as spreadsheets, which we've done for 10 or 15 years, uh, to now publishing them as XML documents. And uh, that was a change that happened uh, last year. And so the first versions of those XML documents are now on the SIMPI Registration Authority website, uh, simpi-ra.org. And uh, so in the process of moving those over to XML, there was a lot of normalization and cleanup that was being done on the documents. And uh, there was also some, uh, they discovered that some of the underlying standards that specify uh, how the metadata is described actually needed to be updated. So there's a bunch of revisions like the ST330 revision, um, the ST336 in, uh, revision. Those ones um, are basically as a outcome of moving to an XML-based uh, environment. And ultimately where we, where we're heading on this is to have an online tool uh, for accessing and even uh, uh, submitting registrations. Uh, that's not quite there yet, but it's coming uh, and there's a lot of activity going on in that area. So that's probably the, the biggest single piece of work that the 30 MR people have been working on and it's been a huge amount of work, I might add. And um, I think we have to do a shout out to the BBC R&D group uh, who invested huge amounts of their own time and effort into making it, uh, taking it from the spreadsheet world into the XML world and making sure that everything was consistent. Yeah, this, is, this has been really fantastic work. And maybe, Peter, you want to chime in about the metadata registry that we have, because this is a huge step forward, I think, for us in the standard side of things. Of we're leaving spreadsheets behind, thank God, and moving into <laughs> for registry. So maybe you can touch on a little bit, and then we'll move on to the 31FS. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, really, the main thing is to echo the comments you made there. The, uh, BBC decided that uh, they, they had noticed, as had others, that a number of errors and inconsistencies had crept into the spreadsheet metadata environment. Uh, I think one of Sempty's problems was, on the one hand, we are much leaders in metadata technology, and it's perhaps unfortunate that that resulted in us starting with tools that were available at the time, um, and the, there really was a need to sort of stop, reorganize, check everything that was there, get rid of any inconsistencies and so on, and republish in a uh, modern tools environment. Uh, I think uh, had the BBC recognized quite how much work would have been needed, they might not have done it. Uh, and uh, they, they, but they did an enormous amount of work in conjunction with other members of the committee um, to get to a stage where we've really uh, got a uh, definitive canonical representation now. We are actually in the process, uh, as we speak, of transferring that work from the BBC servers to the SEMTI servers, and fairly soon that database will be online uh, for uh, public searching. In the meantime, as uh, Alan commented, the XML documents themselves are publicly available on the SEMTI-RA.org website, uh, and we're getting into the 21st century of the metadata. That's fantastic. So um, in looking at the time, I think we're going to move on. Uh, thanks for the updates on that stuff. Again, check out the website. Go to SEMTI RA if you need to for registering things. And uh, this is a, a, a great step in the, in the future. Uh, let's cover 31FS very quickly here. Um, they got through and published a new publication, uh, a revision of uh, 2001, which is XML representation of registered data. 
Uh, we won't cover into that too much. Uh, it's out there on the IEEE library. Uh, go and get it if you're interested in that type of stuff. And let's look at the projects then that they have ongoing in 31FS. Um, bearing in mind, Alan, we want to get to the 32NF, which has a lot of work, and that's next up on deck. So that'll probably take us about 10 minutes to get through. Right. Um, so just, uh, just maybe briefly to highlight, there are several projects involved with uh, revision of MXF documents and uh, um, uh, Bruce Devlin, who's one of the co-chairs of 31FS, is a guy whose uh, email address is mrmxf.org and so he's, he's really the uh, expert and he's leading a lot of that work along with a bunch of other people that are very much uh, involved in the MXF work. So some of that's updating uh, documents, some of it's um, adding some additional capabilities. I won't go into all of the um, all of the documents, but you'll see in that list of documents, uh, probably three quarters of them have something to do with MXF. And that's because it is a, a widely adopted uh, uh, format that's used in a lot of different uh, ways. Uh, yes, you'll see, yeah. I should draw your attention down to the bottom there, there's a dynamic metadata one. So that's a, a file-based encoding for that dynamic metadata that we talked about from Penny, and that is a project that uh, 31FS is, is working on. All right, so 32NF is a, a one of our larger committees and uh, probably our most active committee. There's a big, long list of uh, documents, and you'll see if you look at the actual report, there's like three, three pages worth of projects. Uh, but um, basically, 32NF is involved with all of the stuff dealing with uh, infrastructure, facilities, infrastructure, and interfaces. So um, they're covering, uh, for example, all the work on our SDI interfaces that's been going on and, and continues to go on. Um, and there's actually two groups. There's a uh, 32 and F40 working group that does all of the interfaces up to and including high definition. And uh, then there's another working group that does the ultra high definition uh, stuff. Um, so, just want to back up one slide there. I think Howard. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that's happened uh, recently is that there's been work going on in, in terms of uh, specifying the pathological and uh, check fields uh, for the standard definition and high definition serial digital interfaces, and those have never been updated for a long time. And uh, so those have, have now, uh, some of them are published and some of them are getting very close to being published. Uh, there's work going on on new interface connectors and fiber optic interfaces and that's all happening in the 32 and F40 group. Uh, next slide. Uh, you'll see the haptic uh, tactile essence here. So this is for carrying that haptic tactile essence that we talked about in the 10E. 10E group is describing the essence and 32 and F is working on how it get conveyed. Um, you'll see there's work there on how to carry uh, HDR and wide color gamut signaling on streaming interfaces. So again, that's a fairly new uh, project that's going on, uh, basically a continuation of some of the work that's going on in 10E on defining the signaling and this is how to gain carry it on the streaming interfaces. Um, the video over IP group is working on a, a large a uh, very important piece of work called uh, Studio Video over IP. And uh, the document number there is ST2110. And basically what this is, is this is a new uh, all-encompassing uh, video and audio transport over IP interfaces. And this uh, will be the future way of carrying metadata, or sorry, carrying media around uh, mostly inside facilities, but also um, in contribution links as well. So there's a multi-part document suite that's being worked on. Again, uh, one for video, one for audio, one for timing and synchronization, one for registration. And uh, this work started uh, probably about three or four months ago. They have weekly meetings and uh, it's moving along, but there's a lot of work to do. Um, it started out from a base uh, that was uh, um, submitted by the video services form and uh, so that was sort of the base from which they started but it is actually uh, working uh, beyond that. 
in parallel with that, there is work that's continuing on the ultra-high-definition high SDI interfaces, the 6-gig and 12-gig families, and now the, the base documents are published, the single-link and dual-link versions are published, and now they're working on quad-link ones for some of the higher frame rates and for also supporting multiple signals on an interface. So, again, that's a fairly active group. Um, there, as Howard mentioned right up front, there's a, a new standard that was um, done uh, fairly recently. It's published now, the ST12-3, which is an address, time address for high frame rate signals. So as you probably are familiar, the standard SMPTE time code really only addresses uh, video frame rates up to 30. And so this is a mechanism for extending that to, uh, I think, up to 120 frames per second. And uh, a lot of work that was gone into that. Uh, you'll see down at the bottom of this slide that there is work on brand new time labels. And uh, maybe Howard will speak to that in a minute. But um, the 12-3 was something for right now that people can use today because there is production being done at these high frame rates. Uh, ST2059 is the um, synchronization over IP. And basically what it does is it replaces um, distributing uh, color black around facilities to do synchronization and timing. And it's all based on the IEEE 1588 standard. Uh, the um, Dash 1 and Dash 2 documents were published last year, and there's been a lot of work going on now to uh, test those from implementations of multiple manufacturers. They've had two interoperability sessions, uh, one just a couple weeks ago, where different manufacturers have built to the standard, and they're getting together to make sure that uh, manufacturer A talks nicely to manufacturer B, and that the standard actually is uh, sufficient for people to interoperate. Uh, there's still yeah, ongoing work in that area. If, if I can chime in, hopefully I won't be uh, broken in my audio now. Maybe it's clear. Yeah, sounds, better. But, sounds better. Okay, great. Um, also, this leads to uh, a plug fest and demos that are going on, so stay tuned at IBC with SEMPTE involved in the joint uh, task force for network media. We'll be uh, having some demonstrations in the Future Zone at IBC, and of course at our annual t uh, fall conference, we plan to show a large demonstration of this interoperability coming up. We're going to start running out of time here, so I won't spend too much time on the new time labeling system other than to say that there's a, a couple of proposals, and at the latest meeting, it was uh, sought to go out and seek uh, user input for this. So. Uh, Stay tuned. We're going to try to create some time code summits uh, is the name for them. We uh, try to plan on doing one in the Los Angeles area, New York area, and in London. Um, so that should be coming up pretty soon. Uh, we'll try to get that out to the general community that's affected by new time labels. I'm going to move on to the very last slide. I think this is, let me just check, on 32 and F. Yes, it is. So if you could maybe wrap this up and then we have about five minutes left to cover 34 CS and 35 PM. Yeah. So the 337 family of documents uh, specify how to carry data that's formatted in an AES3 wrapper uh, on uh, streaming interfaces. And so there's been a bunch of new formats that have been developed and this was really just to expand this, the family of documents to include uh, those new formats. Um, and you see MPH, uh, DTS audio, uh, audio metadata. Those are ones that are being added to that family of documents. And then there's a, a study group, I guess, for flow control over professional media networks. Yeah, so that basically this is being uh, done to just to, to have a high level view of, of how do we move um, content around and, and what are the ways of controlling that uh, in, the, in the new world of IP interfaces. And so that, that um, work has um, been going for a while. There's currently a request for proposals out, I believe, a request for information, uh, which I think is uh, sort of closing sometime in August. Um, and I believe that is available on the SIMPTE website if you haven't received it already. Yeah, there, there was a survey that went out to folks, so if, uh, if you haven't participated and want to, please seek that out and participate. I'm, I'm sure Mr. Bowser-Mason would very much appreciate that that runs that group. 
And I think with that, we'll move on to the 34CS, which is control uh, services. Um, Chris Lennon and Carl Paulson, again, won't drive into the scope too much. Um, they have one slide here that lists the project they're, they're working on. Maybe, Alan, if you could touch on these very briefly, and then yeah, we've so got 35 at the end. Right, so BXF is, has been around now for several years, and it's really a a mechanism of um, unifying control of multiple devices in a broadcast environment. And so it started out uh, many years ago with a very limited set of features and they've been building on that. So they're now working on version 5 um, and adding features that have been requested by the industry. Um, I won't go into all the details. It, again, is a very, very large project and if it all happened in one document, it would be hundreds of pages. Uh, so it's been divided down into, I think, about six or seven documents. So I uh, suggest you go and get the, uh, the overview document for that and uh, look at it if you're interested in the BXF. Uh, media device control over IP, again, is a, as a, a way of controlling devices over IP. Simply 2071 is the root number for that. And again, it's a multi-part family of uh, documents uh, that is, uh, some of it is being revised, uh, some of it's actually finished, uh, it's almost ready to fly. And it most recently is a new RDD from Sony uh, for their own network control protocol, a lightweight one. Great, and uh, we come to our last committee, last but not least, uh, 35 p.m. This really is uh, working on one big project and that's called IMF. Um, I could probably chime in here if, Alan, you're okay with that yeah, to cover ahead. these since I've yeah, uh, been a part of this from the staff. So there's one working group that's maintaining uh, two things going on. Basically, one is there's a lot of plug fest now and interchange of IMF files to make sure that uh, interchange is working very well. And it's in this sample material interchange group that meets quite regularly now and has had a couple of plug fests. Uh, actually across the globe. And as they find uh, parts or pieces that may not be clearly understood or maybe broken for that matter, uh, they're updating and amending the uh, the IMF documents to keep uh, uh, working very well and make sure that future ones uh, interchange very well. So that's the amend and revise of those suites of documents that are happening right now. They're also starting to continue doing more work in the output profile list. The OPL is the one that uh, essentially is it, for better or for worse, turns knobs on transcoders to, to and gives instructions for that type of stuff. That's not the only thing it does, but um, there is simple output or OPL lists that are out there right now. But now they're they're diving into more extensive um, uh, OPLs to do a lot more things of down mixing and uh, video transcoding and things of that that sense. Um, also looking into more audio essence and different types of audio essence. Of course, uh, immersive audio will come through here at some point in time. And then there's two new documents, um, one for a content and element definition kind and another one for a new application, which is a mezzanine film format. This one, I believe, has been brought up by the CST for archiving of films uh, in their catalog as well, too. And with that, we've kind of covered very quickly all the work that's gone on in the standards group. So um, I think we have uh, probably not a whole lot of time left. Just thanks, everyone, for attending. And uh, we hope to do this uh, every quarter after our plenaries when the output report comes out to give you guys uh, an update on where standards are at and where they're going. And Joel, I'll turn it back over to you then. Well, thank you very much. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Can you take them? Yeah, certainly. Uh, as long as people are willing to hang out, I, I, yep. I'm fine. Um, one question, and again, you may have covered it, is uh, from Jeffrey. Um, is there or will there be an OV for the studio video over IP work? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> fact, yeah, <laughs> very so, and, yeah, so there will be an OV, um, and all of our multi-part documents typically have one, but uh, more importantly than that, I believe there will, will be an engineering guideline which gives a much uh, wider uh, tutorial on the whole studio video over IP. Yeah, one thing I'll comment on the OVs, the OVs are usually the last ones that get done uh, because basically people want to get the core work done and then they can actually do the overview after the fact when all the document suites are done. So uh, they come a little bit late in the process. Um, the engineering guideline will be really helpful because usually that's done at the same time for that. So uh, Sometimes the OVs are, are updated as new 
uh, new documents are published though, so some, sometimes it might only be the first two parts and then they will just keep updating it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, Amy, our, our good friend Amy Ricca, um, suggested that I post a link to the um, uh, flow management survey. Uh, you okay if I do that in the uh, chat here? Yeah, absolutely. That's sure. perfectly fine. That'd be great. Get great. The, the news out to folks. It is in the chat box there. Um, also, just a final comment. Uh, Ian says, great presentation, very helpful and insightful. Good to see so many paying attention to these standard processes. And with that, yeah, and uh, <laughs> shout out to the 81 to 90 some odd people that attended. So uh, yeah. really uh, is encouraging for us to sit behind uh, closed doors sometimes and do this work. We we want to make sure the process gets more open and and visible to all the folks out there. And, nice and have someone to yes, and Walter Walter actually has a uh, very good suggestion. He says maybe you can explain better how individuals and companies can contribute to the wonderful standardization efforts by SIMTI. Yeah, um, well, there's two ways, and Peter, maybe I'll let you chime in as well, too. Uh, you, you, actually, in the standards process, everyone is treated as an individual, so there is no company representations inside the standards process as it is. However, uh, companies that do sign up for membership do uh, get discounts and things of that nature for uh, a standards participation as well. Maybe, Peter, you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, First of all, in case we run out of time, uh, I think a good resource to look at is semti.org slash standards slash FAQ, uh, and that talks a little bit about the requirements and opportunities for participating in the standard work. But uh, as Howard said, people do participate as individuals. We do make a charge um, for participating in standards that helps cover a small part of the cost of the program. Um, we expect people working in the industry as uh, employees or consultants to pay this charge. Uh, if anyone's uh, participating on their own bat and not making money in the industry, we're happy to waive the fee. Uh, but I think one of the big points to make is, as uh, has been obvious from this conversation, four times a year we do have the face-to-face -face meetings where we pull together uh, all of the standards committees and a lot of the subgroups. And this is an important part of the process, but I think it's really critical to stress that you can participate in SEMTI standards without having to go to the face-to-face -face meetings. Most of our work is done by currently go to meeting, but some, some web platform uh, between the uh, quarterly block meetings, uh, all of those are online only meetings and all of the uh, meetings during the block are also accessible via web and phone. Uh, in fact, you know, we, we sometimes um, have had uh, 40 or 50 people in the room and 40 or 50 people online uh, participating in these meetings and believe it or not we work and it works well. Uh, and you really can participate and be uh, a useful contributor without having to come to the face-to-face -face meetings. And it's, you know, because those, as I say, we think those are still important, but they do represent a lot of cost and they do represent a lot of time. Um, participating in the uh, group meetings uh, between uh, the quarterly meetings and participating in the quarterly meetings uh, is a valuable way, a lot of valuable contributions made that way, and so we try and make it as easy as possible for you to participate. Yeah, and, and quite frankly, if I can add, that's where the real work gets done. So the plenaries is kind of the organizational meetings, if you will, that happen uh, four times a year, but the real work gets done in these smaller groups with these committees, so thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Alan. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Peter, for uh, joining us today. Uh, this is the first of uh, an ongoing series of meeting updates, I, I hope. Um, I'd like to thank our guests uh, for joining us. Uh, I know it, it is, uh, everybody's very busy with their day jobs. And with that, I guess we will close for today. Take care. Safe travels. We'll see you next time on a Simpty webcast. Bye now, everybody.